the key elements was to focus on a on a business plan sort of perspective. Um, uh, Steve Radner sort of described it as a, not as a management job, but as a uh, private equity um, sort of restructuring job. Um, so early on with the initial loans, the condition was set that the companies had to provide uh, business plans that demonstrate viability going forward. That is to say, they needed to restructure their operations uh, and emerge um, with a business model that would allow them to survive on their own. Uh, it took several steps to actually make this happen. Um, and uh, you know, at some point, um, the Treasury or the Auto Task Force actually went in and said, look, this isn't good enough. Uh, we don't buy these assumptions. That's still way too optimistic. You're going to have to go and change your ways more drastically. So the key focus was on the business operations um, to restructure them so the companies could stand on their own feet uh, given the current uh, reality um, in the industry. Um, and, uh, and the second element that was key was the speed with which these changes happened. Uh, from December 2008 through the end of May when GM uh, uh, emerged from bankruptcy, it was all done. I think one number tells it all. In, uh, before the uh, restructuring, General Motors was losing money selling uh, 3 million cars in the United States, and after the restructuring, General Motors uh, was making money selling 2 million cars. It seems as if the changes that were implemented um, have at least some you know, permanence over the medium term um, because this was a near-death experience, as close as you can get to near death without actually dying uh, for both GM and Chrysler. Um, and then subsequently changes were made to the company culture and the company management. There were changes made at the board level um, and at the CEO level. Uh, Chrysler teamed up with a, with a partner company which is now, Chrysler is now part of Fiat, and at GM, um, the majority of the board was changed, including the CEO of the company. And um, that seems to have lasting effects, uh, judging by what's going on with the companies. They're profitable at much lower volumes in the industry, um, and that bodes well going forward. Um, now, having said that, um, it is a somewhat dangerous thing to say things have changed permanently, particularly in that industry, uh, the history of which is littered with examples where the fortunes of individual companies sort of turned around on a dime, you know, sometimes from bad to good and sometimes the other way around. Um, but that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, sometime in the future there won't be mistakes made and uh, you cannot, you know, it's possible to unlearn the lessons from this, from this restructuring. But uh, because things focused, what was the changes that were made focused on what needed to change. Um, and then the, the decisions being made uh, going, uh, going forward, they seem to support uh, success. One reason that to be optimistic about the future for the Detroit Three is the fact that one of the things that has changed in this restructuring is their labor cost structure, and they are, they are set now to be competitive for the first time ever with the international car makers in terms of what it's actually and really and truly costing them in terms of, of their labor costs. Well, the biggest change is something we, uh, we talked about before in the sense that there was a very large reduction of capacity, of production capacity. Um, over a dozen assembly plants were shut down in a time span of less than three years. That's big in an industry that's very capital intensive because these things, uh, these are decisions that are hard to make for the companies themselves. So it helped to have the Treasury sit at the table uh, and say, well, I, I want to look at your business plan. You really don't need that many plans. Uh, we're shutting down a number of brands, yada, yada, and, uh, and there you go. Your footprint needs to be much smaller. So I, sub I refer to this decision as sort of as the gift that keeps on giving. Um, if you can be profitable at a much lower volume, um, remember the industry sales rate went rock bottom, we went to you know, below 10 million units uh, um, for at least six months of the first half of 2000, six months, yeah, the first six months of 2009. So these are extremely low sales rates for this industry. Um, and at 10 and a half million or so, uh, GM and Chrysler can be profitable, Ford as well can be profitable. That's big going forward because people are expecting sales to come back. Uh, and that's, so that's a foundation that's going to last for a long time. Um, and uh, it's one of the uh, indicators that the Federal Reserve Bank keeps uh, track of is uh, capacity utilization 
in the United States in, in the auto industry going back uh, several decades now. And at the depths of the recession, the, the utilization of the factories here reached the lowest number on their record, which was under 30 percent. And uh, that number now in very quickly went up to 70 percent. And that's because, in part, because of some increase in the sales, but it went up very quickly primarily because of permanently removing so many factories from the system. So what we can see now at the current uh, level of sales uh, in this country, the capacity utilization is much higher than it was at comparable periods in the past coming out of other recessions. So uh, in, the, in the past, uh, we've had the recessions and then, and then things increase again, but uh, the capacity utilization has, has lagged. This time, the, that number has gotten up to a much healthier level much quicker. So the more you use those factories, the, the better off you are because you're, you're paying for electricity and you're paying for the cafeteria and you're paying for paper and, and all of these things regardless of the size of, of, of the output coming through. So it's, uh, th this, this is, the Fed has always regarded this as a key number and, and that's what is changed from the past.